Okay, and we are going to close it out with a very interesting man indeed. He is Richard Dawkins, and he is here to talk about his book, An Appetite for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist. Welcome to you. Thank you. I I'm wondering first, after all you've written about so many different things, what made you want to write about yourself? So to go back and look at the young Richard Dawkins. I suppose getting old. Uh, <laughs> That'll do it, huh? Tends to, tends to, to, to do it. Uh, my mother, who's even older, obviously, um, has an excellent memory, and it was a rather good opportunity to um, to, to um, listen to her reminiscing about my childhood. And was that how you did it? Partly, yes, and and the book even includes some extracts from her diaries, which mm -hmm. she wrote at the time. She's a very good writer, actually, and um, so it was nice to recapture childhood, uh, partly from my own memory, which is also reasonably good, and, and, and part of this, pa yeah, and from my mother. And yes. part of his childhood is is in. Uh, Kenya. Yes, yes, and in and in what was then Nyasaland, now Malawi. I, we actually left Kenya when I was two, so I don't remember much about that. But yeah. then, I remember Nyasaland, Malawi, until I was about eight, yeah. and that I remember quite well. Now, appetite for wonder, for for, for what? Every what? scientist should have an appetite for wonder. Yeah. Yes, um, the the universe is such a wonderful place to be living in, and the fact that nowadays, with the scientific worldview, we we understand how we came to be in it mm -hmm. is a truly wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And I came somewhat late to it. I, I, I wouldn't say that, I, that as a child I sort of had that appetite. But um, I really got that as, a, as an undergraduate at Oxford. Uh, and so my autobiography starts in childhood and goes through my time in Oxford yeah. and ends up at the age of 35 when I wrote my first book, yeah. The Selfish Gene. Yeah, which, which was quite a big first book. Uh, it sold pretty Got well. some attention. It was, it, yes, it, yeah. it, it was pretty influential. Yeah. Yes. But you're saying that in the in the early years as a child, um, you did not have that appetite for wonder. I suppose I sort of did. I mean, yeah. uh, I I I wasn't much of a naturalist. I I didn't sort of you know see lions and buffaloes and things. I can remember at the age of six, I think, regaling my poor little sister with facts about the planets and how you know with the, the order they came in and whether there was life on them and yeah. things like that. So yeah. I suppose I did have a kind of scientific interest. Were you a reader? Were you? Yes, uh, I was. I yeah. was kind of addicted to reading. Yeah. Uh, m my father actually would have preferred me to go out into the outdoors with shorts on and, and, and sort of you know br breathe the bracing air. <laughs> and I used to kind of sneak upstairs with a book and, 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 and read. Yeah. But, but science, at least as a deep feeling and study wasn't until your undergraduate years. No, that's right. It was really my second year at Oxford when I, when I kind of weaned myself off the, the high school mentality, which is kind of learning facts in order to be examined by them, mm -hmm. into the university mentality, which is thinking for yourself mm -hmm. and being controversial, uh, writing essays on topics which are where, where, where there's an, an argument on both sides of a question, mm -hmm. so you have to read the original research literature in the library. It yeah. happened to be one of the finest libraries in the world. So you go into the library and read the, the pros and cons and then come to your own opinion. That was a very heady experience for a young man of 19 or, or so. And, 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 and was, there a, was there a figure or a moment? Or what, what, what actually set it off finally? I think it was the tutorial system, yeah. which is somewhat unique to Oxford and Cambridge, where you, you spend a whole week in the library researching a particular rather narrow subject yeah. and writing an essay, which is quite a long essay, yeah. uh, on it. And then in those days, you would read the essay aloud, so you could actually hear your, uh, your prose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Um, and the tutor would either interrupt and criticize or would criticize at the end. And uh, I loved that. And it didn't really matter too much whether the tutor knew anything. Um, it was enough that I was sent into the library to read it up, and it I thought he knew something. Yeah, was, that's right. Yeah. And uh, I, I at least believed the tutor knew something, and that, and so <laughs> yeah. that kept me up to the mark. So w when you when you look back, or when you went back to start writing the story and listening to your mother to go, back, does it look like a straight path? Look, yes, I think from so. there I, to here. Yes, I I did it as a straight as I did I did it chronologically. Yeah. No, I know that, yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah. does it look like? I see how I got oh, here, or were there um, sort of twists and turns? Uh, that's a very good question. Yeah. I, uh, um, I wouldn't say no. I wouldn't say it was th it was that straight. Yeah. I, think, I think it was a somewhat zigzag path. Yeah, yeah. 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 When you w when you get to the um, the selfish gene and the kind of work you you became so known for in, in evolution, um, was it a surprise to you how much of an impact that 
that had? Yes, it sort of was. I mean, I jokingly referred to it while I was writing it as my bestseller. Yeah. But I didn't really believe it would be one. Who, I mean, how could you? No, how could you exactly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, I certainly had a general audience in mind. Mm. But that's a slightly unusual book in a way because it's written both for a general audience and for professional scientists. Right, right. And I do have a little bit of a mission to persuade my fellow scientists to write like that. Well, I was wondering about that yeah. because, you know, not many do and, 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 and some do and you're mm. clearly one of them. But I didn't, but I hadn't thought about it, but you felt that way from the beginning, that you uh, wanted to reach both audiences. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, um, I think I wasn't quite aware of how influential it might be towards professional biologists. I thought I was saying what they already knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, what I was doing in a way was saying what they already n knew, but turning it into a different way of looking at it. It's almost yeah. turning it upside down. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it has been, I think, more influential to professional biologists than I realized. But it's also, of course, been read by lay people. Yeah, speaking of what we already knew or know, I'm wondering what, because these, these debates about evolution continue. I mean, certainly in the political realm and in the cultural realm. How much do we know about being human? We know for absolute sure that evolution is a fact. We know that we're cousins, not just of chimpanzees and monkeys, but of all living things that mm -hmm. have ever been looked at. Mm -hmm. We know that because the DNA code, the machine code of life, is all but identical in all living things that have ever been looked at. So mm -hmm. we, we, we are from a common stem. We are all cousins. We're cousins of kangaroos and jellyfish and octopuses and things like that, which is a startling thought yeah. to some Still. people. And that, yeah. that, that is a definite fact, although uh, you rightly say it's not universally accepted. It is universally accepted by everybody who, who knows anything. <laughs> Um, well, you have famously thrust yourself into these kinds of discussions. I mean, why, why do you think this still is that, I don't know, uh, doubt? I'm sorry to say it's religion. I'm, I'm sorry yeah. to say that it, that, that yeah. it is systematic propaganda uh, by um, churchmen. By no means all churchmen, of course. I right. mean, the, um, the Roman Catholic Church and the, uh, and the Anglican Church are all yeah. perfectly happy, and I think the Greek Orthodox Church are all yeah. perfectly happy with evolution. So it's some of the sort of Pentecostalist, Baptist, uh, evangelicals who are not. And so is your writing, more recent years, writing on religion related to what we were talking about earlier, about, I don't know, reaching to a general audience? Yes. To, you know? I, I, I mean, I think that, that, that writing about religion, for me, is all of a piece with writing about science. I, don't see, them, I don't see them as very separate. Yeah. Um, I think that the hypothesis that there is a creator God, a creati yeah. creative intelligence, is a scientific hypothesis. It's a, it's a wrong scientific hypothesis, yeah. but it is a, a scientific hypothesis and a very interesting one. I mean, if, the, if there really was a creator behind the universe, it would be a very profoundly important fact about the universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you, 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 as I, I said, you, you put yourself out there, you get, uh, you, you say some very strong things in that maybe aren't said that much about, uh, about religion. And you get a kind of pugnacious reputation as someone who will say these things. And that comes to, in some ways, this is Richard Dawkins now. This is the guy, he's the guy who, you know. Yes, I say them in a, in a nice, quiet voice. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't shout. Yeah. Um, I, I do say things which are controversial. Um, I think that's partly because we've all got so used to religion not being criticizable. Yeah. That anybody who offers even mild criticism of religion, it automatically sounds uh, strident and, and, and loud. But um, I mean, I, I've said in the New York Times, for example, that anybody who doesn't, who claims not to believe in evolution, is either ignorant, stupid, or insane. Right. Well, that th that sounds like an aggressive statement. It's just a statement of fact, um, and, and, and almost everybody in that category is ignorant. Ignorance is no crime. We're all ignorant of most of the things that are out to be known. I'm ignorant of baseball, uh, and I, I'm not in the least insulted if somebody says to me, "You're ignorant of baseball." And the people who doubt evolution are ignorant of biology. And it's as simple as that. All right. And, and as far as the Richard Dawkins life story, there's more to come? 
Yes, I, I, I obviously I, I hope so. I'm <laughs> deeply involved in the Richard Dawkins Foundation for yeah. Reason and Science. Richard no, I'm Foundation. sorry, I didn't mean. I meant I meant the sto I meant the book oh, right, is okay. continuing that yes, story. It is continuing. I, okay. I hope the well, rest of the story continues. Well, I mean, I was, I was just saying about about the foundation, yes. which yes. is which, which is occupying most of my time at the moment. Um, I have now f just about finished volume two of the autobiography, okay. uh, which takes me from the age of 35 to the nearly the, the present, uh, and that's. Um, that's not chronological, that's, that's thematic. Uh, I, I, it seemed to be more suitable to do the first one chronologically and then the second one. All right, this book is An Appetite for Wonder, The Making of a Scientist. Richard Dawkins, thank you so much. Thank you very much.